So I'm going to introduce Joel Eckerson to speak first, and then Deirdre Robinson is going to follow him, and they're going to be also talking about the Salt Marsh Sparrow Initiative. Get started whenever you're ready. All right. Let me do it. Why is it? Good morning. Um, today I'm going to be presenting on the two questions we had at the Solmar Square Research Initiative. Other than Steve's questions, these are two other questions we asked. And um, yeah, that's not. It's not doing it. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> All right, so that we had two other questions, and the first was, are there more uh, morphometric changes in the salt marsh bear over time? And the second one was, are these changes related to temperature change over that, that time? So a little background, we have the Allen's rule that basically states animals that are adapted to colder climates have shorter and thicker appendages compared to animals in warmer climates. Mm -hmm. So we can see that in a variety of animals, including rabbits. You have the jackrabbit that has these long ears for um, dissipating the heat compared to the eastern cottontail, which is in a colder climate. You can also see it in humans with the uh, Inuit people, um, and compared to, you know, the Maasai people, they have much shorter and bigger appendages. Mm -hmm. um, so Greenberg studied, um, he studied sparrows, and he kind of found that um, these sparrows that are in very freshwater limited habitats um, are beginning to show like longer. Um, or larger bills, and it's these specific habitats that we decided to look at. Um, salt marsh bears, in particular, how they live in a very water limited habitat, and it's very exposed to the sun, and there's a lot of wind. So we thought the salt marsh bear would be a great species to study this. So here's some pictures of song sparrows on uh, within infrared camera and um, on these photos you can see these bright yellow spots um, that's where there's the warmest heat um, of these birds so of course we have the bill is bright yellow of what other like spots on these birds is pointing out to is very warm and bright legs. 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 yeah you're right um legs have a high concentration of red blood cells that actually have a large role in dissipating heat. So the bill, of course, is a very iconic structure in birds, um, you know, studied by Darwin for its role in foraging, um, and then followed up by the grants. It's also has a role in song development. Um, but this role as a thermoregulatory extremity is kind of nuanced. Well, for me, um, so on the left here, we have um, upland sparrows, and compared with their salt marsh counterparts, they have much smaller bills, they have uh, lower salt tolerance, of course, um, but they also have a difference in color plumage. So if you had to guess, um, would you think that salt marsh sparrows have, or salt marsh birds have a lighter, darker color? Darker, yeah, you're right. So they um they think that might be due to um protecting the feathers from color damage, color fading, and also maybe camouflage in the grasses. So for methods, uh, we measured a hundred or we measured a lot of salt marsh bears <laughs> live and. Um, at Jacobs Point um, in the Upper Narragansett Bay, thanks to our Land Conservation Trust. And we took several measurements, uh, wing cord, length, height, and width. And together with these three measurements, we calculated the fill surface area. Um, and we're a low budget research, so we had to hire out some salt marsh ferrets. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we went to eight different museums um, on the East Coast, and we measured a lot. Uh, there it is, 136 museum specimens. Can compare those to 120 live specimens, and well, what did we find? Um, we found that wing cord lengthened significantly over time, and that build structure also increased significantly. But oh, here's the catch. That was only in males. So <laughs> very interesting. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Deirdre, but I hope you have to answer any questions at the end. She's going to kind of explain some more. So this species, does this, can you hear me? I don't think that works. Oh, so all right. I'm just got to project. All right. So this is considered a monomorphic species, meaning that it has mono, say, one shape. Um, certainly the birds could tell who's the female and who's the male. But unless you have the bird in the hand during breeding season and you blow on the underbelly to reveal the oak of protuberance or the brood patch, you really can't tell a male from a female. But thankfully, they can tell the difference. There is only one morphic change between the two, the two sexes, and that is male wings tend to be slightly longer. However, I would never sex a bird just on the, the length of the wing alone. I, I spent two winters in South Carolina um, in the non-breeding season, and we would catch adult birds, and I would be, well, this is, and they don't have any reproductive organs um, that are, are revealing that they're sexually active. But I would never just use wing alone because there's so much overlap. If this is the wing of the female, this is the wing of the male. Um, so that's the only way that they were different. So I wanted to give a little context for what uh, Joel talked about. Um, this is a local study. I read this years ago. There was a, a professor of ornithology at Brown. His name was Herman Bumpus. And um, his book was called Yankee Naturalist. Um, and on his way to work on College Hill, one February 1st, 125 years ago, um, he found a bunch of um, house sparrows lying in the snow. He went to his office, alerted all the graduate students, and they collected as many of these birds as they could. And roughly half of them died. I don't know if you ever had this experience where you're driving along the road and you know, in the breakdown lane, you see what you think is a dead bird. And, and my habit, I can't break, is I pull over to people, I'll take it home and I'll put it in the freezer and you know, see what I can learn. Um, much to the chagrin of the person I live with. Um, <laughs> uh, so what has often happened to me is I'm driving along, I put the dead bird on the floor on the passenger side and I'm driving along and I hear flutter, 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 flutter and it's, it's actually not dead. It was just stunned or had a concussion or whatever. They so many of these immobilized sparrows he thought were dead, but in fact they revived. So he looked at the survivors and he measured everything he can measure on a bird, um, mass, weight length, um, uh, bill size, um, and uh, he determined, and this has been looked at by other researchers and questioned, but he found that this was an example, probably the first example of climate, actually, a better word for this would be weather, because weather is a discrete event where climate is over time. But this is the first example of a weather having a selection event on a species that could be studied. So this was really a hallmark study. And what he found was, if you look at a, a normal curve, he found that among the females, that those who deviated the most from the natural phenotype, um, at either extremes were the ones who died off. So his conclusion, and I think he 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 wrapped it sort of in Christian language at the time and said, well, you know, the, the more we deviate from you know the way God thought we should be, then the more riskier it is. So he put an interpretation on that that um, wouldn't be acceptable today. So this is an example of a stabilizing event of a selection event. But you know, what we're finding is that climate actually has directional, um, it acts as a directional agent. It is moving uh, the anatomy in a certain direction, and that makes sense that it wouldn't be at either end. Um, and what, what uh, Joel has said to us is that there are changes now in the surface area, the larger surface area now compared to birds that were 100 years old, but just in the males. And that's really interesting. 
And we found that the wings are getting longer, but just in the males. And my question to you is, why would that be? Females like bigger bills and more wings. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a classic sexual selection answer. I, I didn't. I, he's not a plant. He's <laughs> a biologist. Um, um, so, um, so what, what he's suggesting is that the females are selecting these features. So, natural selection. How does it work? Um, first of all, but just to define it, it's a differential reproductive outcome based on the selection of traits. So let's use humans as an example. What trait, can you think of a trait in humans that you're pretty confident that females are selecting for, and therefore they're gonna mate with them and have more offspring that have the same feature. Can you think of one feature? Hi. Who said that? <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Yeah. So females are selecting taller men. So what's happening to the population of children over time? So there's a great study in Denmark that showed the Danes are getting taller and taller, but it's not just the Danes. So that's an example of, of selection. But um, Paul's point that perhaps this is happening because females are selecting them, that's the classic example, uh, the classic explanation that it's, that it's female choice that's driving selection. But in fact, we don't really have any evidence that females are exerting choice. Um, I've spent, I started studying this for in 1990 when I was a grad student in URI. And I, and so it's been over 30 years, but I've never really seen any female solicitation as you see in other species. Uh, there's no, um, uh, and I, I've never seen any, any selection events at all. In the literature early on, uh, one of the early researchers, John Greenlaw, maintains that there actually is female solicitation. I've never seen it. Um, uh, and I have my doubts about that. Um, so it's probably not female selection. Uh, it's probably something else. And that something else is rising temperatures. Rising temperatures are probably driving these anatomical changes. So it gets back to this question before I get to this slide. Um, why else would there be a difference between the effects of temperature on males versus females? It has to do with behavior, doesn't it? So how do male salt marsh sparrows differ in their behavior from females? Well, the females basically would rather run or walk through the glass, grass than fly. They spend a lot of their time incubating eggs or feeding nestlings. They leave the nest very briefly to drop fecal sacs to keep the nest clean or to get food and bring it right back. Um, the males, on the other hand, they sit up. Um, in the literature, they re refer to them as bachelors. The bachelors are sitting up often right next to each other because they're not aggressive toward each other. They're not territorial. They don't fit any of the usual parameters for birds. The males sit up exposed to UV light. And then the, 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 the term that John Greenlaw used was scramble polygyny. They all race when they see a female leave the nest. They all race. And basically, the first one there is the luckiest one. That's basically how it works. And sometimes you see a male knock a female off the uh, on her flight path, get down, copulate with her, it takes one to two seconds and, and be gone. And usually the female will hide as soon as that happens. So the males behaviorally are increasing their own body temperature much more than the females. And that may be an explanation for why increasing temperature is acting as a driver exclusively on the males. And this is the first time this has actually been shown. There also, in the time that we live now, there's also evidence of unnatural selection. Anybody know what this bird is? Blue swallow. Yeah. So blue swallows build their nests under bridges and overpasses. And what's happening to them is so there been a, a, uh, a 17 year study that looked at the roadkill of cliff swallows uh, who nest on these bridges versus um, looking at the measurements of wild cliff swallows. And what they found is a statistically significant difference in the ones who are being killed on the road are the ones with the longer wings. Mm -hmm. That what's, what's happening is that nesting near a highway is the driver 
for actually shortening the waves. And the theory behind that is, well, five minutes, the theory is that um, you can take flight more quickly with shorter waves. And so the ones where the shorter wing cliff swallows are taking off and avoiding collision. So now we're, 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 we're evolution is going toward taller humans and shorter winged cliff swallows. Overall, what is the evidence for climate acting to change anatomy and birds? There have been several studies. Um, I'll just summarize them and say, in general, the smaller birds are experiencing the most selection pressure. They are changing the most in response to um, climate change. And what are the alternative hypotheses? It is not climate that's driving changes in anatomy. What else could it be? Well, the two most common are the one that Paul Miller mentioned, sexual selection being a driver, which I doubt very much is actually a factor in this species. And the other would be um, that it's the competition between males. The males with the longer wings um, are able to fly more quickly, which is true. So it, and um, the males with the larger surface area to the males are probably going to be able to dissipate heat better. Um, so here's an example of sexual selection. Um, uh, this is a bird that I got in Belize in November. as a, a royal flycatcher. But um, I don't have time to put it down past. So um, the second hypothesis is that the changes in, in anatomy are being driven by population density. And Jim O'Neill has done his GPS mapping, and you can see there's a pretty densely populated area. Um, so that doesn't fit our study either, because ours is quite a height. The way it works is the lower the density population, the more likely there are going to be anatomical changes, because you don't have that many males to compete with. But if you have a lot of males to compete with, it's sort of not worth your time or your effort to change your anatomy. Um, uh, this is a sketch that Joel did, the iconic photo of the uh, canary in the mine, this Welsh miner. And this is Joel's interpretation. As a teenager, he drew this. And he drew the salt marsh sparrow outside of the globe. And I asked him, why did you do that? And he said, because pretty soon there's no more room for this bird on this planet. They just cannot adapt quickly enough. They're, you know, they're, we have evidence that they're adapting, but we know from Steve's excellent presentation, um, it's not going to be quick enough. Any questions? <laughs>